Hello everyone and thanks for watching. My name is Ben Richards and I'm the Business and Communication Librarian at Cleveland State University. Today we're going to be talking about copyright and fair use. First, let's talk about what copyright is. Copyright is a protection on tangible works of authorship. In the United States, copyright is written into the Constitution. The laws have changed over the years in many different acts and court decisions, but the general principles have stayed the same. The person who creates something tangible, called a work, by writing, drawing, painting, or recording, should have the final say in how that work is used. Whether or not you know the ins and outs of copyright law, it affects your life each and every day. It's the reason you have to pay for your textbooks, pay to see a movie or download music, and the reason it's illegal to copy these items without permission. Think copyright is just a set of laws that protect authors, movie directors, musicians, and other people working in a creative industry? You're wrong. If you've ever written an essay or taken a picture on a camera or cell phone, you are a copyright holder. What's more, copyright serves to balance the protections between copyright holders and the public. Copyright has been designed this way so that science and art could flourish rather than be overly restricted. Essentially, copyright gives the creators of work certain rights. These rights are the right to copy or reproduce their work, the right to distribute or sell copies of their work, the right to create new works based on their previous work, and the right to publicly perform or display a work. However, copyright also imposes limits on these protections, which is how it balances between protecting the rights of the copyright holder and the public. What can be copyrighted? For something to be protected by copyright, it must first be tangible and fixed. This generally means it must physically exist, like a manuscript written on a typewriter or even notes jotted down on a napkin. However, as new technologies and mediums have developed, tangible can be harder to define. A sound recording on a record player or a tape deck is certainly fixed and tangible, and according to copyright, a photograph, video recording, or even a word file on a computer serves as tangible and fixed work. Live broadcasts also serve as tangible and fixed in the eyes of copyright. The work must also be original, meaning it cannot be a reproduction of some other work. Lastly, to be protected by copyright, a work must involve at least minimal creativity. A common example is that a work must be more creative than an alphabetic listing of phone numbers in a phone book or a blank form. The layout and design of the phone book or form might not be considered minimally creative, but the raw information itself is not protected by copyright. So what is protected by copyright? By copyright, the previous example hinted that factual information itself cannot be protected by copyright. No one owns claims to facts themselves. However, one is entitled to original expressions of facts like a nonfiction book or a scientific article, a poster or a chart, or a documentary. Similarly, ideas themselves are not protected by copyright. If your masterpiece hasn't been put to writing or some other tangible form, it isn't protected by copyright. Likewise, even the underlying idea of a protected work, like a song about being heartbroken, cannot be protected. The individual lyrics, composition, performances, and recordings can be protected, but others are free to write songs about the same themes and in the same style as a protected work. These two limitations support two major tenets of copyright. It is meant to promote the sciences and arts, not prohibit them. Where does our system of copyright come from? It's written into the Constitution that Congress can give authors rights to their works. However, copyright law has a long and complicated history. I'm going to give you a very brief summary of some of the highlights. Our story begins in 1710 in Great Britain with the Statute of Anne. This statute established rights for authors of works. It also established a limit of protections of 14 years on works, plus an additional 14 years if the author was still alive. However, authors had to license their work through booksellers and publishers. 
In 1787, the United States Constitution was ratified. It included a passage granting Congress the right to give authors protection for their works. In 1790, the Congress made good on this mandate, passing the Copyright Act of 1790. This act granted authors, note, not booksellers or publishers, the rights to their works for 14 years and the right to renew these protections for an additional 14 years. In 1841, the court decision Folsom v. Marsh decided that Charles Upham had infringed upon the copyright of a collection of George Washington's letters when he copied large portions of many of these letters. Upham argued that he had not copied the entire collection and that he was not harming the author, George Washington, who had passed. The judge, however, argued that an entire work, or even a large portion of the work, need not be copied to constitute copyright infringement. Rather, the letters Upham had copied were deemed the most interesting and the most valuable to the collection, and that their heirs of Washington's letters, those who had, not, had published the collection, still held the copyright. This decision would become one of the foundations of fair use doctrine. In 1891, the International Copyright Treaty was signed. This was spurred by publishers in the United States who were selling cheap copies of books by European authors. At the time, copyright law only applied to works authored in America. Following the signing of the treaty, countries recognized copyright protections of works from other nations. In the 1970s, there were several important developments regarding copyright and fair use. In 1973, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the National Library of Medicine and National Institute of Health when it decided that their photocopying of scientific journal articles by publisher Williams and Wilkins Company was considered a fair use of the copyrighted material. In 1976, an agreement between publishers and educational organizations established what was considered minimally fair use in copying of books and other published material in the classroom. In 1984, the Supreme Court ruled that videotaping broadcast television episodes for the purpose of watching them at a later time on VCR technology was considered fair use. In this case, Universal Studios sued Sony claiming that their new Betamax tapes and players could result in damages due to consumers copying their programs. The court ruled that copying a program to watch at a later time, which they called time shifting, was not an infringement. Scholars note that the technology was actually a boon to the entertainment industry, later opening a market for the purchase and rental of VHS tapes. In 1988, the United States signed to the Berne Convention. A major development from this action is that works no longer needed a notice of copyright to be protected. The mere act of authoring a work qualified it to be protected by copyright. In 1998, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was passed. Among other changes, it offered amnesty to internet service providers who might otherwise be held accountable for infringement occurring on their networks. It also established the Digital Rights Management, DRM, as a legitimate means to prohibit access to copyrighted material. Throughout this time and since, there have been many other changes to copyright law, including several copyright term extensions. Remember, when copyright was established in 1790, the term of protection was 14 years plus another 14 years if the author was still alive. This was a total of 28 years. A work published today is protected for the life of the author plus 70 years. Based on current law, works published before January 1st, 1923 are no longer protected by copyright. The public domain refers to anything that is not protected by copyright. After a work's copyright expires, it enters the public domain. At this time, it can be copied and used without permission. Other works are released into the public domain by their authors. For instance, most publications from the federal government are not protected by copyright. I said earlier that copyright law balances the rights of copyright holders and the public, 
but so far we've pretty much talked about how copyright holders benefit. The public only benefits after copyright expires, right? Not true, thanks to something called fair use. Fair use is a set of standards that helps to dictate what the public can and can't do with works protected by copyright. There aren't hard and fast laws, so each situation has to be interpreted case by case. Within fair use, there are four factors to be considered for each case. The purpose or character of the work, the nature of the original work, the amount and substantiality of the work being utilized, and the effect on the market of the original work. Let's look at each of these factors in more detail. The purpose and character of your use. This factor looks at how you are using a copyrighted work. The first thing to consider is if your use is commercial or non-commercial. Generally speaking, non-commercial uses are much more likely to be considered fair use than commercial uses. In the court case between Sony and Universal Studios, the court found that the use of Betamax technology to record television programs and watch them later was largely a non-commercial use, and thus fair. As you know, if you record television shows or movies and then reproduce and sell them, you are partaking in a criminal act. However, by using a copyrighted work commercially, you do not automatically discount yourself from fair use. Works can also be used transformatively. This means a new work uses directly or indirectly parts of a copyrighted work and adds significant value, either creatively or critically. News programs or writers do this when they show short clips of a broadcast, film, or other event, or quote short passages of a work. They are adding value by discussing and critiquing a copyrighted work. Another form of transformative use is parody, an art form that critiques another work by a mixture of imitation and transformation. Think Weird Al songs, the scary movie series, or the movie Spaceballs. It is inherently impossible to produce a parody without using some small aspects of a copyrighted work. Educational or scientific uses of copyrighted works are also considered transformative. Using passages of a novel or sections of a film in class is considered fair in most cases. However, using sections of a textbook as a teaching tool in a classroom would usually not be considered fair as it is being used for the exact same purpose as the textbook was written to be used. The second factor looks at the nature of the work being used. First, of importance here is if a work was created to be informational or creative. The use of a creative work will be given more scrutiny than the use of an informational work. Remember, facts are not protected by copyright. Second, it must be considered if the original work was published or unpublished. Copyright law assumes that an author or creative of a work should have rights to decide when a work be first published. The third factor looks at the amount or substantiality of the copyrighted work being used. In most cases, the more taken from a work, the more likely you are to infringe. However, there are two exceptions. In parody, Courts acknowledge that more borrowing is necessary and is transformative in nature. On the other side, if a small portion of a work taken is considered to be the heart of a work, the fact that it is tiny will be outweighed by how representative that portion is of the whole work if the use does not significantly pass for fair use on other merits. The last factor to consider is what effect the use of a copyrighted work might have on a potential market. This means to ask, will the copyright holders lose out on something through this new use? The new use of a work does not have to be in direct competition to an original work to have an effect on a potential market. For example, in one court case, a sculptor was sued for using a photograph as the foundation for a series of sculptures out of wood. They were able to sell the sculptures for a large sum of money. The artist claimed the photography would not have made sculptures and that their use was fair. However, the court disagreed. The artist was still having an impact on the potential market for sculptures based on the original photograph. Another good example is that of fan fiction. 
Even though a writer may never create the storylines that fan fiction writers develop in their stories, there is still a potential market for those stories, using the characters and backstory developed by the original author. Parodied works will be treated differently again, even if a parody has an impact on the market. For example, if a parody changes public opinion about a movie, reducing demand, it has not taken the place of the original work. Now we're going to look at some modern day examples of issues involving copyright and fair use. The first case we'll look at involves music. First, pause this video and listen to the back-to-back -back comparison of Got to Give It Up by Marvin Gaye and Blurred Lines by Robin Thicke and Pharrell. Do they sound similar? That's because Pharrell and Robin Thicke were inspired by Marvin Gaye's music when they wrote and recorded Blurred Lines. Marvin Gaye's estate sued Pharrell and Robin Thicke on the basis of copyright infringement. While some of us probably like one song more than the other, there's no doubt they share some musical qualities. However, how similar does music have to sound for it to infringe? And how can you improve that one party infringed on the other? What aspects of copyright could you use to determine if they infringed on the copyright of the original? The jury reviewed the two songs, heard from music theory experts, and decided in the end that Pharrell and Robin Thicke had to pay damages to the estate. Do you think that Pharrell and Robin Thicke should have argued fair use protections, rather than that their song did not infringe on the original? Have you ever seen this picture? It was taken by photographer Daniel Morell during the devastating earthquake in Haiti in 2010. However, you might have seen it through a different channel than Morell intended, or at least approved of. Morell posted photographs to Twitter. They were re retweeted by another user, and at this time they were picked up by staff at AFP, a French press agency. They were downloaded by AFP, and then licensed through Getty Images and published in newspapers like the Washington Post and New York Times. Morell claimed that they were infringing on his copyright, and AFP sued, seeking a claim that they were not infringing. Morell countersued for copyright infringement. What argument do you think AFP used in their defense against copyright infringement? AFP and Getty were found guilty for copyright infringement and had to pay significant damages. Twitter's terms of services allow images to be posted and retweeted, but users remain in control of the copyright and there is no allowance for images to be used commercially without permission. Do you think AFP and Getty or other news publications could have used the images differently? Now, Twitter allows images to be embedded in their platform on other websites. Have you ever seen this photograph? This is a photograph taken with David Slater's camera of a macaque in 2011. Why did I say David Slater's camera and not David Slater? Because the macaque physically pressed the shutter button to take this monkey selfie. Wikimedia hosted the image, and Slater has claimed since that they are infringing on his copyright. What do you think their defense is? They believe, as do some lawyers and scholars, that an image created by an animal cannot be protected by copyright because animals do not have legal rights. PETA actually claimed that the macaque does have legal copyright to the image and sued on behalf of the monkey photographer in question. However, David Slater does hold the copyright to the images in Britain. This case was included just to give you an idea of how strange copyright law can be. What is different about social media than other types of media? Everyone is generating content. From Facebook posts, to tweets, to Instagram photographs, to snaps, to SoundCloud, it's an awful lot of copyrightable content accessible for free. So who owns the copyright to all that media? Well, what do we know about copyright law? Copyright is held by the creator of the content. You do not need to register for copyright or include a copyright notice. The mere act of taking a picture on your phone is creating a copyright protected image. 
But what about the fine print in the terms of services you agree when you register for a website or download an app? Are you signing away the rights to all of your content? In most cases, no. If the website is based around content generation, there is usually a clause that assigns you, the creator of the content, rights to the copyright. There are sometimes additional lines that allow the company to use your images or other media and allow others to share or embed the content using their services, but you still own the content outright. What protections exist? There's nothing you can do to stop people from downloading or otherwise capturing your content and redistributing it as their own when you share it online, but you are legally protected because you own the copyright. If you are sharing creative work you wish to later sell or profit off of, you might consider being restricted of, of what you post. Social media can be both a blessing and a curse because it gives you wider exposure but many people think whatever is on the internet is in the public domain, which we know is false. The last item that we'll talk about is Creative Commons licenses. What is a Creative Commons license? It's a legal, human-readable, and machine-readable license for copyright in the digital age. From what we've seen, copyright can be pretty confusing, and the variety of different formats and media types that exist because of computers and the internet aren't making things any simpler. A Creative Commons license is assigned to a work by its author. The license tells users exactly what they can and can't do with the work, so there's no guesswork involved. It's also digitally embedded, so it's easy to search for and track down. The licenses are, tell users if derivative works can be shared, if commercial use is allowed, and if other versions must be shared with the same license. Any combination of these requirements can be included. This is great for you as a user because you know exactly what you can and can't do with a work that has a Creative Commons license. This is also beneficial to you as a creator. You have complete control over how your work is used. There are many websites that make sharing and finding Creative Commons work easy like Flickr, Wikimedia, and even YouTube. If you click on the link to the research guide, I've created a list of resources that use Creative Commons licenses. This is the Creative Commons webpage. From here, you can learn more about Creative Commons licenses, as well as search for Creative Commons media. Let's say we'd like to license an image we took. We'll choose our license. From here, we can see all of the different components of the Creative Commons license. Yes, I would like people to be able to adapt my work and use it in new ways. No, I would not like to allow commercial use of my work without permission. The selected license is Attribution Non-Commercial 4.0. Creative Commons work must still be attributed to the creator. If you do not wish to have any rights to your licensed work, or unlicensed work rather, you can choose a public domain license, CCO. What if you'd like to search for licensable media instead of creating your own? Well, let's search the comments. Instead of the regular Google Images search, we'll look on Flickr. Flickr is user-generated photographic content. Before searching, you, su you should specify what components of the license you need. F pretending we're doing a school assignment, we don't need this to be for commercial purposes, but you might like to modify or adapt the image before putting it in your work. Because the copyright a Creative Commons license is created by the content creator. You know exactly what you can and can't do with all of these images. Well, that concludes the lecture. As you can see, copyright is anything but cut and dry, and it has great implications in our everyday lives, all the more so with today's digital media environment. Please feel free to email me or make an appointment with me if you have any questions. 
My email is b.c.richards at csuohio.edu. Thanks for watching.